Our subject for this week's video is an interesting man, a world traveller and author, who always seems to find his way back to the area, seemingly finding it the only place that he really belonged. A strange mix of dreamer and eccentric, who always found his own way in the world, but was often plagued by his own inner demons, and today is most commonly remembered for his work that inspired the motto of the city of Norwich. George Henry Borrow was born on the 5th of July 1803 in his grandparents' house on Dumpling Green in the village of Deerham in Norfolk. His father was Thomas Borrow. Originally from Cornwall, he was an officer in the West Norfolk Militia. His mother Anne was a local farmer's daughter who was descended from Huguenots who had come over from France many years before. Due to his father's profession, he would spend much of his early life moving around the country to wherever the regiment was posted. We will cover the history of the Norfolk Militia properly on another date, but all you need to know for now is that it was formed in 1759, and by the time of George's birth, it was about to enter one of its busiest periods for many years. Two months before his birth, the Napoleonic War began. Fears of French invasion ran high, and militias from all over the country were being called up in defence of the nation. In 1805, the West Norfolk Militia, along with the East Norfolk Militia, were sent to join forces with the Nottinghamshire Regiment of Militia, stationed near Winchelsea in Sussex to act as coastal defence troops. George did not have a particularly happy childhood, and seemingly from a rather early age he developed a state of thinking that today would be considered depression, but George simply referred to it as his shadow or his horrors. By 1811 the threat of French invasion had greatly diminished largely ended before it even had a real chance to begin, following the defeat of the combined French and Spanish fleets at Trafalgar in 1805. And now, with success and victory being gained by the Duke of Wellington across Portugal and Spain, the only French coming to Britain now were as prisoners of war, who needed to be guarded. The job fell again to the militia. George was ten years old, and his father's regiment was ordered to take up guard duty at Norman Cross Prison, in Cambridgeshire. While there, Borrow struck up a rather strange friendship with a local herbalist and snake catcher, who gave him a tamed and defanged viper as a pet. George took it with him everywhere as others would a dog. It is said while walking in the nearby woods one day, he was confronted by a group of boys from a nearby gypsy camp who wanted to know what he was doing there. During the altercation, the snake that had been laying around his shoulders and that they had mistaken for a scarf raised its head and hissed at them. Somewhat shocked, one of the boys, named Ambrose Petalengo, commented that George must be a snapengro, someone who catches and charms snakes. The two boys soon became friends, and this would be the first meeting that would lead to him throughout his life having a great affinity for Romany people he met all over the world. The story may seem far-fetched, and it is quite possible that it is. It comes from one of the autobiographies he would write many years later and there are several tales from his childhood that may be somewhat embellished as George loved to put across this image of a man of mystery. Another slightly dubious tale from his childhood finds him sitting by a roadside, drawing what he thought were strange lines in the dust. He was then approached by an elderly Jewish man, who after some words and gestures that George did not understand, left saying the words, holy letters. Leaving George to believe, he was coincidentally drawing words from the Torah. The June of 1814 brought what would be a temporary peace between Napoleon and his enemies, and a month later the Borrows returned to Norfolk, taking rooms in the now long gone Crown and Angel on St Stephen Street in Norwich, and George was soon enrolled in Norwich Grammar School in the grounds of Norwich Cathedral. I've also seen it said that he spent just under a year in a school in Edinburgh, but I've been unable to work out exactly when he did this. But regardless, when it came to Norwich Grammar School, George hated the place, with its rules and restrictions. He found the whole experience stifling. He would spend much of his time telling stories to the small group of friends he had made. And the only lesson he ever really took to was languages. In 1815, the militia got marching orders again, this time for Tipperary in Ireland. And for George, the happy news that he was being taken out of school to go with his family. While there, George learned to ride a horse, both with and without a saddle, and continued his love of storytelling to whoever would listen to him. 
He was placed in a Protestant academy that he seemed to like far more than Norwich Grammar School. While there, he would learn Latin and Greek from a friendly clergyman, and was taught the basics of the Irish language by one of the students there, who George had given a pack of playing cards in return for the lessons. When not in school, he spent much of his free time with what was described as vagabond elements of the populace. The regiment moved on to Temple Moor in 1816, where George spent much of his time walking the countryside, but his joy was to be short-lived. Within a year, they had returned to Norwich, buying a house in Willow Lane, and his father had retired from the army. And once again, George was back behind the stone walls of Norwich Grammar School, where, like many with a deep dislike of school, he rebelled, soon finding himself marked down as unruly. Along with three boys he had befriended, he hatched a plan to run away to Caister, where they were to live in the caves and help local smugglers for money. Their plan fell apart around Akel, when they met with the parents of another boy from their school who knew who they were. They invited them in and fed them, but secretly sent word to the school's headmaster, Edward Volpe, who soon had the boys dragged back to Norwich. As leader of the Sissel expedition, it was George who got the worst punishment, being flogged in front of the whole school. George had hated the school to begin with, but after this humiliation he detested it, and preferred to educate himself something he would do to great effect. He bought old school books from second-hand shops and learnt anything he could from people who were willing to teach him, including French and Italian, of Reverend Thomas d'Esterville, an interesting character and a bit of an adventurer himself, who despite his occupation was rumoured to never be without a pistol close to hand, who lived in St Locket's Yard of St Andrews in Norwich. It wasn't just academics that interested George, he also took up boxing, being coached by John Thurtle, the son of a mayor of the city who would meet his end on the gallows in 1824, and certainly a subject for a future video. Although George was said to be a very talented boxer, and certainly had the physical presence to match, being six foot three, but it was something he would never follow as a career, but would always hold it close to him, watching matches when he could, and often commented that the secret to a quiet life was to learn to box and keep a civil tongue. His carefree self-education would carry on until 1818, when he was hit hard by one of his horrors, a feeling he could never fully explain to anyone. When asked by his mother exactly what these horrors were, all he could say was, Of nothing I can express. Mine is a dread of I know not what, and there the horror lies. The stress of these horrors clearly affected him greatly as his striking blonde hair of his childhood was totally grey by the age of 20. As you would expect for this period, his father had no time for his son's horrors, and saw him more as an excuse-making troublemaker, who would rather spend more time with unsavoury characters than minding his studies. To get him back on the straight and narrow, he arranged for George to take an apprenticeship with William Simpson, a city clerk and solicitor, who had an office in Tuck's Court on St Giles Street. Unsurprisingly, George did not spend much of his time in the office, often disappearing off to Mousehold Heath on the edge of the city, where he would spend his days learning from the gypsies and the prize fighters. If he was not there, he was most commonly found in the library learning languages. He did go into the office sometimes, but things rarely went smoothly, especially with George's motto of keeping a civil tongue. One of the clerks there was from Wales, and often the butt of many a joke, impression, and mocking comments from a couple of the others. When George got word of this, he confronted them, telling them it either ended, or he would be more than happy to teach them some manners. They soon got his point, and the matter was dropped, and the grateful colleague agreed to teach George Welsh in return for what he had done. Languages were a huge passion for George, and learning them came easy to him with it being said that he could understand 12 languages before the age of 18, and by the end of his life had at least a basic knowledge of around 100. He was almost entirely self-taught and by private tutors, rather than the long university courses undertaken by the linguists of the day. If ever questioned about the unusual course of education he had chosen for himself, he would simply reply with one of his favourite quotes he had picked up while reading the Talmud a Jewish religious text. Who is the wise man? He who learns from everybody.
His constant search for knowledge soon found him under the tutorage of another we must cover in the future, William Taylor, a writer himself and a bit of a political radical, who was keen to get George into being a writer as well, realising that it was something that he would excel at. George agreed. His first was a translation of Friedrich Maximils von Kligger's version of the Faust legend, which he entitled Faustus, A Life, Death and Descent into Hell. Being one with a bit of a sense of humour, in his translation, Borrow altered one of the lines to change the name of the city mentioned. They found the people of the place moulded after so unsightly a pattern, with such ugly figures and flat features that the devil owned, had he never seen equalled, except by the inhabitants of an English town called Norwich, when dressed in their Sunday best. So outraged were the Norwich Public Subscription Library, copies of the book were burnt upon publication. Other translations followed, with him soon being published in Sir Richard Phillips' monthly magazine in 1824. The year would bring many changes for George. Not only was he now a published writer, but it also brought the death of his father. He was buried in St Giles Churchyard in Norwich, but sadly his grave is now long gone. Like many an idealistic young man at the time, George had visions of his writing career taking off. He quit his position in the law firm and made the move to London. But as so often the case, he quickly learned that the streets were not paved with gold. Despite writing several articles while there, he soon found that money did not last, being forced to live on bread and water while living in Grub Street, where his health soon began to suffer. And then, to make matters worse, his horrors returned. He would recover with the help of friends and would leave London soon after, spending the next few years practically penniless, travelling around the country, living a very bohemian life, working odd jobs, even teaching himself how to fit horseshoes while living with the travelling communities he had become so fond of. When he had finished with his travels and returned safely back home, he carried on his translation work, translating romantic ballads from Danish to English in 1826. George's skills with language and translation would come into their own in 1833, when he was contacted by the British and Foreign Bible Society in London, asking him to come for an interview. He naturally agreed, but there was one rather large problem. He didn't have enough money to make the journey. Not a man who was put off easy. George walked the 112 miles from Norwich to London to attend the interview, a journey that took him 27 hours. They were impressed by him in the interview and they hired him on the spot. George would spend his first six months with them learning Manchu, a Chinese dialect that was one of the official languages in China until 1912, but now has been largely replaced by Mandarin. After being well versed enough in this, he was sent off to St. Petersburg in Russia on the 13th of August 1833 to overseeing the printing of the New Testament into Manchu. George was instantly taken by the beauty of St. Petersburg. I have previously heard and read much of the beauty and magnificence of the Russian capital. There can be no doubt that it is the finest city in Europe. In total, he would spend two years in the country, helping with the translations of the Bible, during which he gained a great love for the Russian people, describing them as the best-natured, kindest people in the world. And although they do not know as much as the English, they have not the fiendish, spiteful dispositions. And if you go among them and speak their language, however badly, they would go through fire and water to do you a kindness. And as he seemed to, wherever he went, he sought out the Romany communities, spending time with the group who lived outside of Moscow, and became more adept and familiar with the Romany language, so much so he published a Romany to English dictionary in 1835. He only ever had one regret during his time in Russia. When he went to visit the poet Alexander Pushkin, he was out. George left him a couple of his books, but never returned, and the two would never meet. When his work in Russia was concluded, he returned to Norwich in September 1835. But he would not be home for long. The Bible Society were quick to put his skills to work again, sending him off to Spain and Portugal on the 11th of November 1835. What might sound like a rather mundane mission was anything but when it came to Spain. The country was gripped by the Carlist Wars at the time. Supporters of Queen Isabella II fought bitterly against supporters of Carlos V, her uncle, 
over who should rule the country. Undeterred by any of this, George freely roamed the countryside on a black Andalusian stallion, translating the Bible and frequently arguing with priests in the country about the nature of the church, which was, of course, not without his dangers. He found himself arrested three times and at one point came close to facing a firing squad for being a spy. Despite this unpleasantness, George rather liked Spain, especially how authentic it seemed to be and how few foreigners he ran into, like in other places in the world, even when he was visiting the larger cities, although I'm sure the ongoing war probably had something to do with this. But he would later write, The huge population of Madrid, with the exception of a sprinkling of foreigners, is strictly Spanish, though a considerable portion are not natives of the place. Here are no colonies of Germans, as at St. Petersburg, no English factories, as at Lisbon, no multitudes of insolent Yankees lounging through the streets, as at Havana, with an air that seems to say the land is ours whenever we choose to take it, but a population which, however wild or strange, and composed of various elements, is Spanish, and remains so as long as the city itself shall exist. And, as you would expect once again, whenever he could, George would be found spending time with the Gypsies and Romanies of Spain. By 1839, George had taken a house in Seville and made contact with an old family friend, Mary Clark, who had been widowed and now had a grown-up daughter, Henrietta. She came to live with him, and the following year they returned to England, where he married Mary and the three moved to London for a short time, before making their way to Mary's small estate in Alton Broad, near Lowestoft, in Suffolk. Now settled, George really began to write. His first full book, entitled Zincali, an account of the gypsies in Spain was published in 1841 and was a minor success, inspiring him to write his second book, The Bible in Spain, also known by the much wordier title, The Journeys, Adventures and Imprisonments of an Englishman in an Attempt to Circulate the Scriptures in the Peninsula, recounting his many adventures across the country during his five years there, was published in 1843 and became a huge success selling 20,000 copies in its first year. And to put that into context, that is three times more than the now far more famous Pitwick Papers by Charles Dickens sold the first year that it was released. Eager to follow up this success, he began to write another book on his life and travels, entitled Lavengro, meaning Wordmaster, even beginning to travel across Europe again for more stories, venturing as far as Turkey but after being hit with another bout of depression, he would stall, and it would not be published until 1851. His next book was a sequel of sorts, telling more about his travels and his life, that went by the name Romany Rye, meaning The Gypsy Gentleman, which came out in 1857. Both books were a mix of autobiography, dreams and folk tales that he had picked up along the road, with even him describing the first book as a dream of study and adventure. Due to this, it makes it hard to tell what moments in his life are wholly true and what he has embellished, as mentioned before. More importantly, this also confused the readers of the time, meaning neither book would sell as well as the Bible in Spain. After the Depression put pay to his travels in 1851, he returned back to Britain, and then he and his family moved from Lowestoft to Great Yarmouth in Norfolk. While there, George would spring into action to save the life of a stranger. It was the 8th of September, 1853. A bad autumn storm was hitting the coastal town. A barge just out to sea was caught by a heavy wave and nearly capsized. One of the men was thrown into the raging sea. George and a couple of others ran into the heavy swell to try and save him, with some of the waves coming down on them reaching 30 feet in height, forcing the others who had gone into the water back to the shore. But thanks to his height, George was able to make it further out and pulled the man back to shore. Towards the end of the 1850s, his mood had improved greatly, and while writing the previously mentioned Romany Rye, he travelled around the British Isles, walking in all weathers, often seen carrying a rather battered green umbrella with him. Another move came in 1860 to Brompton in south-west London, possibly prompted by his mother's death in 1858 that made him wish to leave the area for a time. While there, he worked on a number of books, but only one, Wild Wales, would be published during his lifetime, coming out in 1862. 
telling of the times he had spent in Wales, as well as local folklore and stories of the areas. Tragedy would strike on the 30th of January 1869, when Mary died of what is described as valvular disease of the heart and dropsy. She was laid to rest in Brompton Cemetery. George was inconsolable and his horrors hit him hard. He had already fallen into somewhat of a depression a few days before Mary had died, and now he ultimately blamed himself for his inability to care for her in these final days had been what had really led to her death. To try and take his mind off it and keep his horrors at bay, he threw himself into writing letters to anyone he could think of. In a rush of emotion, he even proposed to a childhood friend, the writer and etcher Lucy Brightwell, but she politely declined the offer. His next book, Ramonio Livio Lil, was published in 1874, but was very poorly received. His response to the news was to say he was moving back to East Anglia to die. He returned to Alton Broad and would spend much of his time in Norwich drinking in the Norfolk Hotel, a building that is now gone, first replaced by the Norwich Hippodrome and now St Giles Car Park, just up the road from where his parents used to live. When in Alton, he was mostly seen walking the village with a pet sheepdog he now had, and where he sadly became known as the village eccentric. Children often kept their distances, and locals would treat him with indifference. A real shame, as throughout his life, George had loved nothing better than telling his stories, especially to children. With George now getting on in years, Henrietta and her husband came to live with him and take care of him. But it was not a great arrangement. Henrietta was not much of a housekeeper, and the property soon started to reflect this. And George had an intense dislike for her husband, even going as far as when he made his will in 1880 to make it very clear that he would inherit nothing from him. Despite his advancing years, making it virtually impossible for him to leave his home, and the subsequent loss of his much-beloved walks, he never lost his wit. When asked by a local vicar exactly how old he was, George was quick to reply, Sir, I tell my age to no man. The last time George Borrow was seen alive was on the 22nd of July, 1881. Henrietta and her husband had to go to Lowestoft for a few days for work. Borrow made it very clear that he was not happy with this, but finally agreed. When they returned on the 26th, they found him dead, aged 78. Exactly what he died of is unknown. It was recorded simply as decay of nature. He was buried on the 4th of August, 1881, and laid to rest next to Mary in Brompton Cemetery. Like so many authors, he was largely forgotten by the end of his life, but would find the resurgence after his death, even if it was not always accurate. Norwich would hold a celebration to mark the hundred years since his birth, a nice gesture, but somewhat diminished by the fact they misdated his birth by a full decade, holding it in 1913, and many of his unpublished works would not reach the public until 1923. His connection to the motto of Norwich comes from his description of the city in the book Lavarengo. Fine old city, truly it is. View it from whatever side you will, but it shows best from the east, where the ground, bold and elevated, overlooks the fair, fertile valley in which it stands. Gazing from those heights, the eyes behold a scene which cannot fail to awaken, even in the least sensitive bosom, feelings of pleasure and admiration. At the foot of the heights flows a narrow, deep river, with an antique bridge, communicating with a long, narrow suburb, flattened on either side by rich meadows of the brightest green, beyond which spreads the city, the fine old city, perhaps the most curious specimen at present extent of the genuine English town. From this would come the simple line found on all signs as you enter the city, Norwich, a fine city. And for those interested, the antique bridge he refers to is Bishop's Bridge that can be found in the Bishopsgate area as you head towards the cathedral from Mousehold Heath. There is no end to memorials of him all over the country and indeed the world. The house he had lived in in Willow Lane in Norwich was brought by A.M. Samuel, the Lord Mayor of Norwich, in 1913, and was gifted to the city, which operated as the George Borrow Museum for many years, until it closed its doors in 1994, with money raised from its sale then, used to create the George Borrow Trust, which aims to preserve and promote his work. It is now a privately owned house, and largely hidden by a set of modern flats, 
which are adorned with a plaque commemorating him and some of his works. Other memorial plaques to him can be found on various buildings he has lived in, such as in 22 Hereford Square in London, Trafalgar Road in Great Yarmouth, and even 16 Keller Santiago in Madrid. There is a residential crescent named after him in West Norwich, and there is the George Borrow Hotel near Aberystwyth in Wales. And in Deerham, the village of his birth, the local pub is named the Romany Rye. Similar to the presentation we did on Elizabeth Fry, George Borrow is also remembered by one of the schoolhouses of Old Buckingham High School. And as a former member of that house, I believe I can unbiasedly and safely say it is the best one of the five. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. All of the information and pictures used can be found in the description below. Please feel free to like and subscribe if you wish. This was George Borrow, the man behind Norwich's motto, and this was A Little Bit of History.